Hi everyone, my name is Jigni and I'm a business researcher here at Insight. Today I'm joined by the amazing Mac Conwell or Mac the VC. He's the founder and managing partner of Rare Breed Ventures. I'm super excited to have the opportunity to interview him. Um, Matt, thanks so much for joining me today. Absolutely. Thank you for uh, reaching out and I'm looking forward to it. Great. So um, I think let's start off by, uh, I've had the opportunity to learn a lot about your background. Um, could you begin by telling me more about how you became the managing partner of Rare Breed and your, and your journey to venture capital? Yeah, so my, my journey has been an interesting one. You know, I was, I was a software engineer as a government contractor for years. Um, then I went on to start two startups. One, the first one was an exit. The second one, not so much, you know. Uh, I went into loss, you know, it's kind of kind of par for the course here. And then um, I got the job at a marketing firm after my second company failed. And that's clearly not what I saw for myself after being the CEO of two startups. Mm -hmm. um, and so after that marketing firm got a client I didn't agree with ethically, I quit. And right after I quit that job, the investment arm for the state of Maryland put out that they were hiring. And so um, I applied and ended up getting a position working for the seed investment fund. So that's how I broke in and started investing. While I was there, they were struggling to invest in underrepresented founders, specifically black-led startups. And so I was able to start a pre-seed fund there to invest those entrepreneurs earlier than anybody else. And it, it is now known as the Builder Fund. It is the first and only state-backed pre-seed fund for women and minorities in the country, something I'm, I'm really proud of. And, but the thing is, while I was there at the state, you know, we started this fund to be able to reach and support amazing entrepreneurs that were otherwise being overlooked. And I was getting frustrated because while we were investing some really great companies, there were some other equally as amazing, if not more amazing companies that we were leaving out because those founders were too early, right? Or people didn't understand their markets. And that was, and it was getting frustrating to me because like I could clearly see the vision and the opportunity and where these were companies had the potential, but the people around me, not so much. And so I basically just decided one day that I was going to start my own. I ain't really just decided. I got pushed. Um, and so like, as I kept meeting founders that I wanted to back, <clears throat> I met this one founder in Texas, uh, a guy by the name of Roberto who runs a company called RoboAmp. And I thought it was amazing. And I thought it was criminal that he couldn't get funding. So I tried to put an investment group together to make an investment in his company. And when I did that, one of my advisors told me they didn't want to invest in that one company. They wanted to invest in every company that I found to say, hey, let's, let's, you know, here's 250, go raise a fund. And so I did. Um, and so that's kind of how I got the rare breed. It just, it came out of the frustration of, finding amazing companies and having to go to an investment committee who <laughs> would say no to things that I knew they were wrong about. <laughs> as arrogant as that may sound. <laughs> and I think that's really cool because you have, you, when you were at um, the state of the investment arm at Maryland, you invest in pre-seed fund, pre-seed companies. Mm -hmm. And at Rare Breed, I know that you guys focus on investing in pre-seed companies. I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you, a little bit more about your investment thesis. Yeah, so our investment thesis is we look to be the first or one of the first investors in every company we're in. So we do pre-seed to seed investment. So companies that are sub 10 million post money valuation, we'll go a little higher sometimes, but sub 10 is where we like to be. Investing in companies primarily outside the major tech hubs, so outside of Silicon Valley, New York, and Massachusetts. We'll still make investments in those areas as well for the right companies, but generally speaking, that's not where the bulk of the deal flow will come from. Um, and um, we're industry agnostic. We don't do life sciences because like, I don't have a PhD. If you have a therapeutic, I have no way to like review that or, or, do, or do diligence that like, it's just not my skill set. Mm -hmm. But we'll do just about anything else. And what we look for is if it's a software tech enabled company, we like to see a clearly repeatable or unique customer acquisition strategy. Mm -hmm. Don't have to have a lot of customers, but you need to know how you get your customers. Mm -hmm. And then we like physical products, typically in consumer markets that have lacked innovation for 10 or more years. These kind of legacy markets. Mm -hmm. um, it's because those two founders tend to be out of the box thinkers and care very intentionally about customer acquisition, experience and retention, mm -hmm. which are the three pillars that, you know, we really look at. Cool. And just to build off of that, um, 
I think that, I think it's really cool how, as part of your strategy, you guys focus on um, companies that are outside of the three main areas. Because I actually read a statistic that said, I think it was in 2019, 78% of total venture funding went to Massachusetts, California, and New York, which is just insane. Like that majority of the funding is concentrated in three, those three regions. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to know, like, why do you think that's the case? Like, why do you think that reach? Um, majority of the funding is based in those three regions. Like I get that there's a lot of great companies headquartered in Silicon Valley or in New York, but why don't VCs step outside of those three main regions? Density of capital, which leads to density of talent, right? So because it's just like um, when you think about the music industry, right? Or, you know, if, if, if you want to be an actor, what do you do? You go to LA. Yeah. Why? Because that's where all the music studios are. Yeah. And the music studios are the people who bankroll having movies made. Mm -hmm. I'm the movie, this is mm -hmm. where you go, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing, right? Silicon Valley is where a lot of this stuff got started. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, the initial, like they have a head start on everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And so the density of capital in that location just naturally pulls people to be there because it's the only place on the planet that you can go to where you can go into a restaurant and in that restaurant, you can have a product manager from Uber, mm -hmm. um, uh, a C-level executive at a startup that just raised $2 million, mm -hmm. uh, three VCs, like, like you can literally just bump into somebody and they could be a titan of industry, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is the same thing as like being a waiter in LA, you just, you're hoping that, you know, as you're waiting tables, you run into a movie producer or act like it's the same thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it, it just, it makes it easy for the capital to flow when everybody's so intensely packed in mm -hmm. same thing with New York and then Massachusetts. That's where all the life sciences stuff is, right? That's where, mm -hmm all the deep tech stuff is. Uh, and that just has to speak to the universities in that area that have that head start. So that's why that's where the money goes. Mm -hmm. um, and so then the incentive to have to go out and find the next great startup, the need to leave where you are is lessened, right? Like if you're a movie producer in LA, you know you can go into any restaurant and every mm -hmm. waiter there is a wannabe actor, right? Like mm -hmm. you don't need to go to like Utah mm -hmm. and go yeah. try to find the best actor. like. You, the person from Utah probably came to, came LA. to LA, yeah. And so that's why that happens. Um, but that doesn't make it right, right? It just makes it lazy, mm -hmm. right? Like, it's so much easier for me to manage my time if I only have to go and deal with people that were within an hour driving me. Mm -hmm. You're telling me I got to try and find entrepreneurs in Kansas City? Mm -hmm. That's a little bit more work. I got to go to Birmingham, Alabama or Baltimore, mm -hmm. Maryland? Mm -hmm. yeah, but... I could go, you know, 10 blocks down the street to a meetup and probably find an entrepreneur that's, you know, got a shot to be just as good. So why, why do anything else? Like that's the mindset, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. And so that's, that's why I think it happens. But, you know, I think, you know, there are a lot of investors trying to change that, myself included. And COVID's also going to change that because investors have had to get comfortable making investments over Zoom. Mm -hmm. You know, making investments with founders they've never met, mm -hmm. which means these founders could be located anywhere in the country mm -hmm. or anywhere in the globe, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. I've met with founders all over the planet in the last six months, right? Um, and so a lot of them are people I never would have met before COVID, right? So we'll see what the, we'll see how that changes the, changes the landscapes over time. That's cool. And one thing going back, because in a previous conversation we had, one thing that you mentioned to me um, was that a founder should ask themselves, do we need to raise funding? Because it isn't always the case. And I thought that was a striking point because I just thought that the natural, uh, like natural inclination would be, okay, once we, we're, once we have to start raising as much outside funding as we can. So as someone who bit, has been through the process of, as a former founder, what questions should a founder ask or what process must they embark on to determine if their company is in a position where they do need to raise funding? You have to determine if you want to be venture backed, mm -hmm. right? Do you want to be, do you want to be on the treadmill of raising money, right? Cause I, I believe the stat is on average to reach a billion dollar valuation, you need to raise 
on average, $89 million mm -hmm. of outside capital. Mm -hmm. That's capital across multiple rounds yeah. from a bunch of investors, right? Like that's, that's a lot of time fundraising, pitching. Like, is that what you want to be? Is that the goal that you want? You know, if not, then that's fine, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's more than one way to start a business because at the end of the day, venture capital is nothing more than a tool. Like it is money that you get as a tool to grow faster. It is not a success metric. Mm -hmm. Raising money is not a success metric. Like mm -hmm. I think founders forget that. And I don't think VCs forget that sometimes too. Like, let's be clear. Right? It's not a success metric, but what it is, it's a tool for you to grow. And so like at the end of the day, when you have your business, you can only grow by the profit you make. Mm -hmm. Whatever your profit is, that's what you have to grow with. Mm -hmm however you use that. Mm -hmm. And so if you feel like you could grow faster with more with capital beyond your profits, well then, you know, venture capital, depending on your business model could be right. Mm -hmm. But like those are just personal decisions that you have to make mm -hmm. as a founder. Like how do you want to manage your company? What kind of culture do you want for your company? Do you, you want investors? Do you not like all these things? Um, and none of these answers are easy, right? Mm -hmm. These are all hard questions that, you know, take a lot of time to think through. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. I think that's a really, really good point because oftentimes I feel like maybe the industry has perhaps like glamorized raising money and they think raising money is the metric for success. When in reality, as a company, your job is to grow, your job is to make a profit. Your job is to, you know, either go public, be acquired. I don't know if your job is to make a profit. Like Amazon's made hmm. a profit, I think maybe 10 quarters of the entire existence. That's right? a good point. So like making like making lots of revenue yes making tons of profit questionable mm -hmm. <laughs> so um just to i guess move on um as so you've been on both ends of the both sides of the equation a founder and a, as an investor so i'd love to add my question is um what are some tips you would give a founder and what are some tips you would give an aspiring venture capitalist or a, or a new venture capitalist so for founders, I always go back to the idea of um, distribution over design, mm -hmm. where really at the end of the day, I don't care how amazing your product, like I care, like your product can be the most amazing thing on the planet. Mm -hmm. That matters mm -hmm. to a point. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if nobody's buying it or using it. Mm -hmm. right? You can spend all the time in the world making the best product known to man, but if nobody buys it, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. So never forget that as a founder that you need to be in tune with your customers mm -hmm. and you need to figure out your customer acquisition. Like that is customer acquisition is what gets you paid mm -hmm. either with funding or a revenue, like mm -hmm. the customer acquisition is that, right? Um, sometimes I think founders get too caught up in, you know, trying to make the most, the greatest, most innovative product that they can. And yes, there's something to that, but you also need to make sure that people want to use that product, that people are going to pay for that product. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't done the work to figure that part out, you might just be wasting your time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, I, my favorite example of that is the iPod. Like the iPod is a crappy MP3 player. The original iPod is a crappy MP3 player. It is the item that was broken and sent to Geek Squad more often than any other product in Best Buy's history. Mm -hmm. And at the height, of the iPod, Best Buy had a wall of other MP3 players. And more than half of them were better quality products than the iPod. The iPod's the only one that won. Because they figured out the marketing and the customer acquisition strategy and everybody else couldn't, mm -hmm. right? And so it doesn't matter if you had a better product, mm -hmm. a more successful buying mm -hmm. product, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. iPod won, that's, 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 that's how that works. And so keep that in mind for aspiring VCs, you know, it's not right, but this industry is built on networks. Mm -hmm. So spend the time building your network now, mm -hmm. getting to meet and getting to know other VCs, um, you know, VC Twitter and VC clubhouse is a thing, mm -hmm. right? If you uh, start to follow a bunch of VCs on Twitter, uh, start to go into some of these clubhouse rooms and, you know, send them some DMs, tweet at them, there's a certain portion of them that are going to respond to you and take that meeting mm -hmm. and that'll get the flywheel going of you growing your network and then also start figuring out how you can help companies mm -hmm. right so start mm -hmm. meeting with startups 
start helping them, start trying to create impact for those companies so that when the time comes and you go to that job interview and you look to get a job in VC, you can tell stories about entrepreneurs that you've supported and helped mm-hmm. along the way and how you were able to find and source amazing companies. Um, that'll, that'll go far for you in this world. That's some great advice. Um, that iPod point you made is really cool because if you think about it, an iPhone is just an iPod touch from which you can call it when you think about it at the end of the day. That's all it is. That's all it is. And it's been, it's one of the most like successful products in history. Um, so that's a really, really good point. Um, just a couple more questions I had mm-hmm. was my, my, my second question was one of your, um, like in your manifesto, one of the things you guys talk about is that you want to invest in company in industries that are legacy that haven't seen innovation in a long time. Um, what are some of those examples? I know in a previous conversation, you talked about how the hair care market is a, is a good one. Um, what are some examples besides perhaps that, that you've, you've seen that are in desperate need of innovation that maybe there hasn't been in any in a long time? I mean, there's so much around this, right? Like when you go into a convenience store, when you go to like uh, 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 a pharmacy and you look at all the different products on the wall, Mm -hmm. just think about how many things there look and do the exact same ways they have since you were born, Mm -hmm. right? And just be like, is there really not a more efficient or better way to do or create any of these products Mm -hmm. there probably is right Mm -hmm. um you know this company called windmill they make a bluetooth enabled in window ac unit Mm -hmm. because in the world of nest and everything your house is connected to your phone why wouldn't my in window ac unit be connected to my phone Mm -hmm. right like Mm -hmm. just just makes makes sense right Mm -hmm. yeah Um, the idea that we're having these robots that are being built that can you know cook you meals and cook you dinners like yes of course it makes sense like we all seen the jetsons we all thought that would be here by now but like the idea that you know you could have a a stove top where you don't need to set a temperature you could put in what you're cooking and it automatically sets the temperature for you Mm -hmm. like i'm doing stir fry with vegetables and poultry and they'd be like well do the poultry first then you know, let us know when you do the vegetables and automatically variables the, the temperature. Like, we have technology smart enough where mm-hmm. they could do that. Mm-hmm. So why not, right? So, so when I think about stuff like that, it's just like the everyday things that you see and do that you've done your whole life one way, is there a better way to do it? There probably mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. And why hasn't anybody done the better way to do it? Or is there somebody out there doing yeah. it a better way? You just haven't found it yeah. yet. That's the way I kind of think about it. Kind of like just like it's kind of like that old saying like uh, I'm not the exact word but like trying to reinvent the wheel. You're just, just trying to find like innovate stuff that hasn't seen innovation in, in a long that's time. Right. That's, that's right. a good. That's a good point. And my final question is um about a, I think a few weeks ago you published a really interesting medium plo- post on medium blog post where you talk about how your New Year's resolution is you want to be a catalyst for change and you want to help fund tw- at least 25 diverse fund managers or venture capitalists. And I thought that was a really, really, I really enjoyed reading that. Um, that is a great piece. And I think it's an amazing goal. Just wanted to know, like, it, it's, we all, we've, we've talked about this before, but funding, venture funding is hard. It's not equitably distributed. Um, certain women, people of color have a harder time raising funds. I think last year, women only got like 2% of total funds raised. So as someone who's, again, been on both sides of the shoes, both sides of the equation, what can founders do to ensure they get equitable chance to raise funding? And what can VCs do to ensure that they're funding diverse founders? Well, founders, it's hard for a founder because the founder doesn't really have the leverage in that that sense, unless you're already growing Mm -hmm. really quickly. If you're growing Mm -hmm. fast enough and you're Mm -hmm. generating enough revenue, Mm -hmm. you have the leverage, you can make it happen. Generally speaking, a lot of the onus falls on the investors to get beyond their comfort zone. Mm to look at markets that they normally don't look at, Mm -hmm. to consider founders of backgrounds they may not normally consider, Mm -hmm. and to be intentional about getting out of their own hubris and just expecting everybody to come to them or come within their network. Mm -hmm. If you want a more diverse network of founders, 
if your own personal network isn't diverse, well, then you need to go change that. <laughs> but you have to be willing to do the work to do that. And so mm -hmm. if you're not, there's nothing I can do for you. That's a great point. Um, so Matt, I think that just that just about wraps up our interview. I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time. You've given me such amazing answers and I really, really enjoyed talking to you. I learned so much every time we do. It's been a pleasure. Been a pleasure, man. Well, you have a good one and we'll talk again soon. Thank you so much.